this week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. Values count, character matters, and integrity matters too. And if you can lead your life, lead your life in some type of exemplary way while you're building something fantastic for your family and the future, then somewhere people are going to be talking about you and they're going to say, I wish I was more like you. And that's a heck of a compliment. This episode is brought to you by the Salty Sailor Coffee Company, the official coffee of the Deep Leadership Podcast. Salty Sailor is a veteran-owned coffee brand on a mission to deliver premium, fresh roasted coffee while making a positive impact in the world. Their motto is drink coffee and do good, which reflects their commitment to making amazing coffee and actively supporting the military community. 10% of every order goes to the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, an organization dedicated to helping sailors, Marines, and their families in times of need. All our listeners get 10% off every order of their amazing coffee by using the discount code DEEP at checkout. So check them out at SaltySailorCoffee.com. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today I'm joined by Elliot Callen. Elliot has amassed a wealth of leadership experience over four decades running several companies he founded. These companies include Prosperity Financial Group, an investment advisory firm with almost 1 million assets under management, and A Brighter Day, a nonprofit organization that provides scholarship funds and mental health resources to teens experiencing stress, depression, and suicidal thoughts. He is also the number one Amazon bestselling author of Driven, How to Elevate Your Success as an Entrepreneur, which is a book that provides invaluable insights, lessons, and strategies on how to succeed as a leader and entrepreneur. I'm excited to have him on the show to learn from his leadership experience. So Elliot, welcome to the show. Great to be here, John. Thank you. It is great to meet you, and uh, I'm excited to have you on the show, talk about your book, talk about the success you've had throughout your career. But first of all, let's talk about leadership. How would you define leadership, and what do you consider the three pillars of leadership? So, John, I deal so much in the corporate world, and if I could talk a little bit about the corporate leadership rather than, let's say, the military leadership or the nonprofit leadership, would that be okay? Sure. Okay. So in a corporate world, we're talking about entrepreneurs, and you've got a lot of young people who are just starting businesses, thinking about starting businesses. You've got a lot of women. There are more women-owned businesses today than there are in the history of the United States, and they're past surpassing men-owned leaders on businesses. And then you've got a lot of veterans that we want to figure out how to help these veterans because not just to thank them for their service, but they come back and integrating back in society, entrepreneurship is a great place to be. Uh, if they can handle that and and so forth. So when I think of three phases of leadership or three pillars of leadership, I think of the first phase of leadership, which is I've got an idea, I've got excitement, I want to make something happen out of the dust and create something with my own two hands. Um, I don't want to be employed anymore. Uh, I hate my boss. Uh, all these things that drive people to start companies. Uh, it's not just somebody who has the better widget because there are great programs and you could go on Shark Tank and try to get that. It's kind of a little bit of a joke, but it does have some success. Um, sometimes that, that works. But for the most part, what makes success early on is the ability to persevere. And through all the times of getting your knocked down and your nose bloodied and beaten up and people telling you, go get a job. And this is the dumbest thing since sliced bread. But you know in your heart, this is a good place to go. And you just keep chipping away and knocking at the door and cleaning, coming in on Saturdays and Sundays and cleaning the garbage can and making sure you have some employees that can clean your bathroom uh, besides just you. Now, and that's phase one. You're really working your butt off and you feel like, you know, you've got anvils holding your feet to the ground or your, bo your rowboat is still tied up and you can't go anywhere. But then all of a sudden you start getting some traction. And some, some people start believing in you. And suddenly you, you need to hire some employees and you need to figure out how to do that. And you think, oh, if I've got a good idea. That's all that's required. And it's not. It, that's where leadership begins to form in your business because you are the role model. Everything about you is the role model of your business. If you're taking off because you're not so serious about, so are they. If you're coaching Little League at three in the afternoon because you want to be a great dad or a great mom, so are your employees. You are the role model all the way around. That doesn't make that a bad thing. 
I just remember that, it, you know, like I was getting divorced when my kids were young. Nobody's working when I went to pick up my kids. They kind of stopped. That's just how it is. So that's what I mean by leadership. At some point, you're going to transition into you have a viable entity with some sustainability to it. That people are starting to say, hey, this is good. You're chipping away more. You now need some financing, maybe some accounts receivables financing, maybe a line of credit. Maybe you're going to go out to the market and start to raise capital because you can. That's phase two. Phase two is I'm now building a sustainable entity that's going to grow. And maybe it's going to grow from $800,000 a year in sales to $50 million in sales, whatever it is. But it's going to begin to grow. And you're thinking, holy cow, I've actually created something. I'm not going to clean the bathrooms anymore. I got people that'll do that or a service that'll do that. I'm still going to work on Saturdays a little bit, but I'm going to take off a little bit and go with my kids to Disneyland or, or Disney World. I'm going to take a real vacation uh, with my spouse or a significant other. That's phase two. That's the that's when you are the not only just the driver, but you're surrounding yourself with people that can do a better job at things that you used to do, like CFO. Now it's the time to hire a controller or CFO. Now it's maybe a time to get a general manager or a general sales manager. Maybe you're working with salespeople because you know that you can only cover as far as your two arms can go. And people actually can sell it, do a better job selling this than you and you could be their role model. That's phase two. Different leadership position completely. And you're doing that for a number of years and growing the company. And now you're getting a little bit older. You're in your 50s. You're in your 60s hopefully not your 70s thinking about this, but you're in there and you're thinking, I'm in phase three. It's great, but now what? Now what? My kids are in college or out of college. What do I do? Do you bring your children into the business? Nine, 99% of the time, that's a really bad decision to do that. Sometimes it works, most times it doesn't. Most times it works be to sell the business because your next generation wants your results, not necessarily your effort. And so we talk about that. And then what are you doing as a leader, an entrepreneur? What are you doing to help the greater society, the greater good? All right? Is your do you want to put a build, leave a building with your name on it, a hospital wing? Have you reached that phase of your life? Have you had a situation in your family that's been either cancer or death or something that you want to make an impact with a charity on, like I've done? Do you want to? Give your children some type of foundation that they have to give some of your money away throughout their lifetime, which will help them enjoy a better quality of life with what they do. And we could talk about that too. Or you just want to wipe your hands one day of the whole business and say, you know, I think I'm going to go live in London. Call it a day. Or I'm just going to be grandpa and call it a day. That's phase three. Different leadership, driving the company to the next level, sustainable. Maybe it goes away because it gets sucked up by a bigger entity. Or maybe it continues in perpetuity with new and younger owners or owners like those that listen to your show that can find a guy like me in phase three, maybe the beginning of phase three, and says, hey, Elliot, what can we do to make a deal? I want your business to last for 30 more years. You just don't need to be in it anymore. And that's phase three. Hmm. Interesting. You you mentioned in, in that first initial phase when you're starting up the business and sort of you got the world on your shoulders, you're... You're doing everything from cleaning the bathrooms to making all the sales. Uh, you said something about perseverance and, and the title of your book is Driven. So how how essential is that to get through that first phase? Tell, talk to us a little bit about the importance of resiliency and perseverance in that initial phase. Thank you, John. And I wrote that book because I some people have a straight line in their life to success. They're the exception. They're not the mm. rule. Unfortunately, Social media and society has told you that everybody can become the next Mark Zuckerberg or, or Jeff Bezos. All I got to do is create something in college. And five years later, I'll, sit, I'll go public and it'll be a billion dollars. And, you know, occasionally that does happen, but way less than we think it does. And, and we're talking about you have a better chance of catching a marlin or a sailfish off of Florida than you have of creating a billion dollar empire on like Mark Zuckerberg. But it does happen. And so I wanted to write a book because my line looks anything but straight. It looks backwards and forwards and sideways. And, you know, and, and there, there's my, my son died in the process when I was starting my company up. You know, my, my wife and I got divorced in the early days of my company. Um, those are backward steps in every possible way. 
And so you've got to be willing to say, I am going to do this with blinders on no matter what, because I really believe in it. Now, you can't be so blind to not accept the fact that maybe you have the wrong product or the wrong program and you have to change. But if you know you have the right program or the right product, then you just have to adapt properly. And that's what I mean by a little bit of blinders on. And that's perseverance. And you, you want to do it with integrity and you want to, but you've got to be able to get your nose bloodied all the time. You know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Colonel Sanders didn't start Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was 65. Mm. And he started it because no one anymore would buy his chicken. Mm. And he had this recipe that he liked. So he said, ah, the heck with everybody else. I believe in it, even if no one else does. And that's a lot of businesses happen that way. Like I've got something really cool, but I can't seem to get anybody to do it. So I'm going to do it. And so that's perseverance. And you can't make up for that. My father used to tell me, who was part of the World War II greatest generation and, and you know, born in 1915 and, you know, hit the Great Depression and then hit the war and then enlisted in, in, in 1941 with Pearl Harbor. You can't make up for hard work and perseverance. You cannot do that. You can't make up if I don't want to work 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. Okay, work 30, but then you're not going to have a 60 hour a week business. You can't make up for your you know, failure and going home and saying, you know something, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. You know, and there's there's that always that line I taught my kids, my three children. I said in one of the Rocky movies, and it was by Sylvester Stallone. And it said he said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back up. And that's perseverance. Are you willing to get back up only to know you may get knocked down again? It doesn't feel good. You know, eating your spinach when it tastes terrible doesn't feel good. Mm. But if you keep doing it, you get better at it. You know, and and so my, my grandson is a swimmer, you know, and yesterday he, he's in, he's a magnificent swimmer in his age category. And yesterday he's been winning all these races. And yesterday he, he was supposed to win it, but he came in second. And he was devastated. And I was trying to explain to, to his grandmother, my wife, and said, if we do this right, he will have learned more yesterday by not winning, winning than he learned early in the day than winning. Mm. That's perseverance. Because if he says, I quit because I didn't win, then he gave up. But if he says, you know, if I learn to stretch a little more, to be a little looser, to fix my game, to fix my head with whatever needed, then I can probably cut my time down or get better sales or fewer no's in business than if I didn't than I, if I didn't do that. So you have to learn the hard way. And it is the hard way. As my dad used to say, nothing beats the school of knocks, hard knocks. You got to do that because you get better at it. And you get sick and tired of losing sometimes. <laughs> I'm one of those people that, okay, I'm not doing this again this way. I'm doing it a different way and I'm mad. And that mad creates more inner strength for me. Fortitude, and intestinal fortitude, we used to call that. You know, okay, I'm not, if I'm a blocker in football and this guy keeps going around to my left and beating me, I'm going to figure out how not to let that happen. And that's perseverance and fortitude. You can't make up for that. You can't teach it. You can't give it. It's got to be there. It's, it's really powerful. I know when I started my company eight years ago, I knew that it would be hard. I knew it'd be difficult because we were going up against uh, all of my competitors are 40 billion and above in, in sales. So they're giant. So, and I knew we were going to be the David against the Goliath, right? So I recruited, look for people with grit, with perseverance, some history of overcoming difficult things in their life. And it turns out it worked out okay. Like I have, I have a really resilient team. I have a very, I have a team that's dedicated in persevering through the tough times, and it, we, it helped us through COVID and all that. But I mean, how do, how do you find people? Because I, I was, I, I did it by trying to find perseverance or, or find examples of perseverance in their lives when I was interviewing them. How do we find perseverance? How, how do we develop perseverance? Or is this something that's innate, or is it developed? Uh, is it a character? trait that's developed through tough times. How, how do we find people who have that trait if we're trying to bring them into our business? What we find is a, a great question, John. You asked me actually two questions. Yeah. How do we develop it and how do we find it? Okay. To develop it is something that only one can do on their own, hopefully with some parental or grandparent help. They know that, okay, you didn't do well. 
get back up, let's do it again. I think I taught my daughter that with soccer. She was in travel soccer. She was really good. And so she got picked on a lot, a little bit smaller than a lot of people. And you can see her wanting to cry on the field. And we we talked to her and say, Alexa, toughen up. You could do this. You know, we just talked about that. And my other son was a goalie. I was an ice hockey goalie and a high school quarterback. And I, I would teach him, okay, they just scored on you. Keep your head in the game, short memory, focus. That's perseverance you're teaching. That was my way of teaching him. But I can't do it. I can't be the goalie for him or the soccer player, the, the center for her. They have to do it. Mm-hmm. And they can do it on their own. And it's, you know, you go to the gym. Um, I'm sure you're, you're somebody who goes to the gym. If if you find you're doing something and it's not working, do you simply stop doing it or do you get better at it so you can do it? And and so, so much of this is self-learned and taught by other people, coaches and parents. Matt. But how do you find it in other people? And I would think it's a conversation to have. Hmm. Of course, you'll never know until something adversarial happens. But you can ask that question and, and some type of adversarial question. Say, if this happens, let me give you three options here. Do you say, let's find another way to do it? Do you say, let's double down and figure out the right way to do it? Or do you move on to the next idea? Because sometimes the right answer is to move on to the next idea. Hmm. That's a good business decision. Like, well, this didn't work. I'm going to try th- three things. Two are going to be great. One's going to be crappy. Got to get rid of that one. Accept that. But so much of the person you're talking to could say, well, you know what I found in my experience? If it doesn't work the first time, let's move on to something else. And that's not somebody that's going to persevere. Hmm. It might be a good, de- it actually could be a good decision in the long run. But I want to know from somebody that says, hey, if we think we're on to something, how many tries are we going to give this? Hmm. How many times do we have to go out there and swing that bat? Because sooner or later, if we keep swinging that bat, we get some singles. And then sooner or later, a double. And every now and then, we'll get a home run. But but if we don't swing, we don't get any of that. And in between there are a thousand strikeouts or mm. foul balls. Yeah. But you got to keep swinging the bat to do that. You know? Do you, do you think that we can develop in our businesses as the leader of business, develop a culture of perseverance? In other words, that we have, that the, that the leader leads by example, by, by demonstrating perseverance and also creates a culture where we don't get too um, uh, hung up when we lose. In fact, we, we specifically smile and we say, okay, look, that didn't work. Now, how do, how can we learn from that? How do we pivot to, 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 to improve? Can, can perseverance be built into a culture of a company? Some, some entities, John, are so good at that, that, about that. You know, sometimes police forces and fire for, and fire and uh, uh, firefighting forces, they talk about what didn't work. Mm, this didn't yeah. work. The yeah. perp got away. The house still burnt down. Somebody might have died along the way that should have died. Um, we didn't get there fast enough. What happened? The, and so they talk about that to, because they say, look, if we practice this, we could do it better next time. Sales is no different than that. If we talk about that, you know, what happened here and what happened there? What happened if, with the CFO at the bank? Why did that relationship fall apart so fast? at the bank. If you could talk about that without ripping the person apart Mm. and making it personal, because if it's personal and we point a finger at you, John, you're not going to want to put your neck out next time. Mm. But if we talk about the situation and how we can all grow, then maybe you can walk away saying, well, I don't feel good about what happened, but I also can do it better next time. And that's what you want. No one feels better about failure. No one feels good about failure. Nobody. I don't care what position you're in, what you've done. You're a veteran and thank you for your service. You go and do something on a beach, on the woods, you know, mechanically, whether you're in front of the enemy or you're somebody in the supply chain, it doesn't really matter. If something fails because of you, you feel horrible. Hmm. You, that's human nature. But that, if we do it right, your commanding officer is going to say, John, you could do it better. Let's do it better next time. Not just rip you in a a new one, so to speak. So that's the good manager doesn't need to rip you and make you feel like you're this big. A good manager says, we did it. Now, can we get better next time? How Mm. would we get better? And talk about it. That's how you grow. You grow from your mistakes. But too many people in charge think they're watching too many Marine shows where the Marines 
you know, drill sergeant is in their master sergeant is so in their face, ripping them apart, making them feel small. And they think that's how you're supposed to do it. And you know what I'm talking about from basic training. Yeah. yeah. And they don't realize that they're not, they're just trying to toughen you up. And maybe that's an arcane way to do it. I don't know. I'm not going to comment on the armed forces here. <laughs> We've been doing that for a long time, but it might not be the right way. But to know that you could take that person and build them back up into something without having to rip them down, because most of us in business know that we failed in some form when it doesn't work. And we don't need somebody to point that out. You don't need your father to tell you that, well, you were crappy on a little league field today. That's not going to make you feel better. Mm. But you'd like to hear, you know something, that ball you dropped? We can fix that next time. So you, so you put yourself in a better position to catch it or to throw that touchdown pass or to catch that pass or to make that block or to do anything in business. My mother did something very cool. So I came from a very blue collar family, John. Didn't have a lot of money in that day. My dad owned a small business, entrepreneur, came home every day with his nose bloodied in some form. <laughs> you know, that something went well and something didn't go well. And we talked about it at the kitchen table. And so I played, my brother and I played a lot of sports growing up and, I, I was sure I was going to be the next Joe Namath of the New York Jets. All I needed was six more inches and a stronger arm. <laughs> and if if we did something well, I threw a touchdown pass or ran for a touchdown or made a big save in a high hockey game or maybe caught the third out or hit a base hit to score the winning run. My mother would take us to White Castle in New Jersey. And for $2, she could feed us both. And we get White Castle and orange drink. And we were, we were And we forgot about the game, but we felt great. You know, if we if we struck out to end the game in baseball, or we threw an interception to end the game, or fumbled to end the game, or let in a winning goal as a goalie because I was a goalie, you know, and we lost, and you know, kids blamed you like, how could you let that happen? We lost because of you, and you know, kids can be pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah. My mother would take us to White Castle, and for two dollars, we forgot about the game, forgot about what happened, and we were in a good place. And her thing was, tomorrow's a new day. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah. And so it made us feel better about our loss. Then we could think about it and think about how to get better at it rather than feel horrible about human beings and cry ourselves to sleep, which happens to adults yeah. and children when things don't go well. You know, it almost seems like um, to build perseverance, it, it's it's almost the idea of having a healthy relationship with failure. With, with whether it's an organization or an individual or or, you know, if you're mentoring someone, you know, I know uh, on the Navy, they would make us stand when we were junior, we we're coming up through the ranks, they make us stand. Uh, uh, you were the junior officer of the watch. So you weren't the officer of the watch, you were the junior. So you had a, a senior watch stander above you, but they would give you the deck and the con to you. So you'd be running the whole submarine and inevitably they throw all sorts of, you know, drills at you and inevitably you screw up because there's just, it, you know, they would throw the impossible scenarios at you. And then they would stop the drill and you you spend time learning about what you did wrong, what could you do diff differently, and you have that discussion. But I, I called it control failure. They gave us those chances to fail and to learn, right? And I think sometimes, you know, and I spent 22 years in corporate is that we we never gave people chances like that to fail and learn. It was like we can't fail, everything has to succeed. And we had a we had a unhealthy relationship with failure a lot of times in some corporate environments I worked at. In other words, if you fail, you get fired, right? Everyone has to succeed. And I think that's the wrong culture to build perseverance, right? It makes people afraid of failure versus using it as a tool to learn. Is that, am I going too far with that? Or what Oh my goodness, you that? raise a great point. Embrace failure yeah, you know, and, and grow from failure. Not thrive with failure, but or in failure, but embrace it and grow with it. And yeah. that's a great attitude because you're right. In the Navy, you know, they, they drill and drill and drill and practice and practice and practice. So just, you know, in case that real situation comes across, you're going to be the, at the best you can be. Yeah. That's a great thing. We don't do that in corporate America. If you don't let your people fail, then they'll never try anything new. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think, I think, you know, to build perseverance, you have to have failure. You have to have the chance to fail, learn and realize I didn't die. Right. We got a chance to learn from something and then we can, we can refocus our efforts and, and do it again. And what did we learn? What can we do differently? What can we do better? So it's, all, it's like having a healthy, a healthy relationship with failure versus an unhealthy relationship, which I've seen in some cultures. So it's very interesting that, um, and again, a lot of the lessons you learn, like you said, 
be your your mother, your 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 father, your you know your the your, the people who influenced your life built this into you, right? And just by the way they acted towards failure, it's like, how did they approach failure? Did they learn and from I, it, I, or did they, or was it? And John, end? I doubt they really understood they were doing that at that time. Yeah, no, I know that. That's what's really interesting. So they sort of hardwired into you. Do you notice? And again, I'm I'm working with all different age groups and the people I hire. Do you notice anything different with younger people in terms of their, their ability to persevere? So the hard part, I know you've got a very young audience, John. Mm. The hard part with Generation X or whatever, Y, whatever we want to, I don't know what Z, Gen Z, I think is too young yeah. here. Talking about. The hard part is that we as parents, I'm going to put some guilt on my group here. Mm. We as parents didn't do a really good job of letting them know that things can get tough. They didn't have to work for things very hard. School came easy. Adversity really didn't happen a lot. If you and I, when you and I were young, John, if, if we were playing baseball on the street and we got into a fight, tomorrow we had to make up because tomorrow we needed each other. Hmm. We just did. And so that was really important. And then we learned adversity, social skills. None of those things are done anymore because now if we got into a fight, guess what? Your mother calls my mother. They get us together. We shake hands and apologize. And tomorrow's a new day. We didn't learn anything at all from mm. this whole process. And so that's the biggest change out there is we're not teaching that you can grow. You can mm. learn. We've hovered over them as parents. And so, and then kids, they see the results of their, you know, we're the wealthiest generation ever now because one is we've earned it and two, we've inherited it. Or, or inheriting it, we're doing both. So the kids want the results of our money because they got to go to Europe. They yeah. got to go to summer vacations, which were amazing, way more than you and I did as kids. And they want all those results. So those came easy. They didn't have to save up for that. I think it's great when I see a lemonade stand in the neighborhood, but how many do you really see? Yeah. Once in a while, a weekend type of thing. Kids have to fail. You know, yeah. I, I, they just do. And that's what we've not done a really, really great job with our kids. So they come in here and they say, okay, when do I get my new business cards? When do I get a new title? When do I get to move up? That's why CPA firms have such a hard time hiring young people now because they can't get them to work during tax season, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, because those kids want to be home. They're not willing to make that commitment. Or my industry, the financial services industry, has a really hard time finding young people because they don't want to go out and knock on doors and, and get beaten up. They just don't want that. And that's the reality of what's going on right now. So it's yes, interesting. there's a problem. My, my son's a tax accountant and he has <laughs> and he he has his busy season, he calls it. And he he it's interesting because you said something that, that really strikes me. My, my wife and I had the same concern that our children have experience so much more than we did in in our lives right uh because i grew up blue collar my wife blew up, grew up blue, blue collar that my children have enjoyed our the, the fruits of our success right and um but yet how do you build resilience in in that next generation when they've seen you know they haven't seen the the work that took to get to the success part you know they like enjoyed the results but just not teaching the, sports not is the great process. yeah yeah sports excuse me john sports is great with that yeah um, yeah there are lots of ways to talk about it. There's a Kenny Rogers song, which always strikes me as perseverance. It's about a little kid that goes to the baseball field. And he said, he's singing that song, I am the greatest hitter in the world. Hmm. Um, and so he's tossing the ball up and he misses it. And then he tosses the ball up and he misses it. That's a, the song. And then he tosses the third one up and he swings and it's almost like Casey at the bat. And he swings and he misses. And so he changes the song instead of I'm the greatest pitcher, I'm the greatest hitter. At the end, he says, I'm the greatest pitcher. I just didn't know I was this good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> a little bit of perseverance in that song. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Well, the, uh, the your new book is called Driven, How to Elevate Your Success as an Entrepreneur. Who should read this book? Who's the target audience for this particular book? And it's driven. And make sure you put my name on there because I couldn't, because there's so many words driven, I couldn't um, trademark it. So it's driven by Elliot Callan. Okay. Um, it's for entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs. Anybody who thinks they want to one day be an entrepreneur is to teach the pillars of of leadership and embrace adversity, not failure, but adversity. Mm. Um, because I have a son who passed away 
in the middle of my business career here, took his own life, sadly, at the University of Montana. There's no greater adversity to a family than losing a child. We did that. When I started my company, companies, uh, that was painful because I was getting divorced at the same time. Uh, it just, this is the third, fourth, and fifth companies I've started. One and two I sold, uh, but I really sold them because I had to sell them and I, I made money on them, but I still had to make the next move and I had forced to make the next move. Um, so I've got a good friend of mine. He's the same age as me. Uh, always been in the corporate world, CFO, CEO, worth three quarters of a billion dollars now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his line is pretty straight. A couple little, little <laughs> stuff in there, but for the most part up, I've just never had that line. And yeah. so I want people to know that life is not him. He's the exception, not you and I. He's the exception. Yeah. What, you know, what do you say to young, like wannabe entrepreneurs? I know I talk to a lot of young people when I, I teach, uh, teach at uh, graduate level and I meet a lot of young people that want to start businesses. And so they, you know, what advice do you give them? I, I have some thoughts, uh, having gone through my, the experience myself and realized how difficult it is, even as an experienced uh, leader like I was when I started my business. What kind of advice do you give young wannabe entrepreneurs? That's a great question. I think I would try to find, if I had a product or a service that I thought was really good, I would begin to talk to people about it. Mm. What do you think of this? What do you think? Knowing that some people won't understand it and think it's a stupid idea. But I'd also find people that might be a good mentor for me mm. and give me good advice. So be yeah. careful who you ask for advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would ask people what they think and what they think. What would you do if you were me? And then when I launched this, I would never look back. Yeah. I would get yeah. my mentors lined up. I would meet with them and I would just drive. I'd be the driver. I'd yeah. say, I, I've got enough information. So maybe this has to become that or that because I've been asking and refining and the, or the service needs to become this and that, or it's not being done right now. Um, so this is a good thing. And I'll be the first one to bring it to market, which is yeah. a great thing. Sometimes too early is not a good thing. It's really hard for you. Yeah. No, it's terrible. <laughs> I've yeah. been there before. <laughs> yeah. so. But if you keep refining it and working at it, yeah, and and you accept the fact that you may be the last man standing on this or woman standing here, then you're going to be in a good place. But it's not necessarily going to be easy. Easy is not in the rule book at all. Simple can be, but yeah. not easy. Yeah, it's not. Entrepreneurs don't use the word easy. This was easy to become, you know, build a multi million dollar company. No, it wasn't. Yeah. It was hard yeah. to do that. Um, and so you've got to accept the fact that more people will think you're crazy. Out of your mind, dumb, go get a job. Can't you do anything right in your life? You haven't gotten anything right yet. Um, very critical. And sometimes those people are all related to you. So you got to be yeah. willing to accept that. Yeah. And I often I often think it's in there, they're trying to protect you from from harm. So they tell you you should do, you just get a job. Don't do this. This is crazy. You could fail, right? They're trying it's to risky. protect you, right? But in 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 that, they're 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 a voice of they're, 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 you know, it sounds like criticism when you're, when you're in it, you know, why yeah, are you and, doing this? Yeah. I yeah. would also say that if you're married and you go home, yeah. don't share the negativity. Yes. Own it. Yes. Just own it. But if you share it, your partner is going to become negative and then they're going to regurgitate to you, your negativity. And if you hate it, it's not going to help your marriage out at all. Yeah. But they're really yeah. just talking about you because you, you've been negative all day or all night. Instead, yeah. Find a way to leave it at work, clear your head, read a good business book, watch a movie that's different, get in a moment with your spouse, with your kids, but then wake up the next morning and get back in the game. Yeah, yeah. I think too, you 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 ought to keep it away from your employees sometimes. You know, the doubts, the fears, the anxiety. It's like, I, I for me, I would just go back to the back of the warehouse and I would just, all right, <laughs> sort of clear my head. I used to say, go kick the go kick the dog. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Except the dog doesn't feel good, but <laughs> well, probably bite your leg if you do that. <laughs> right, right. Well, this has been fantastic. Uh, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners? Well, I'd like to leave them with again that word perseverance, but I want to wrap that up in the word integrity, mm. uh, because we live in a world where shortcuts are acceptable, 
our political figures, forget Democrat versus Republican, almost all of our political figures now lack integrity. Um, you don't see it anywhere. The news doesn't have great integrity. I, I think values count, character matters, and integrity matters too. And if you can lead your life, lead your life in some type of exemplary way while you're building something fantastic for your family and the future, then somewhere people are going to be talking about you and they're going to say, I wish I was more like you. And that's a heck of a compliment. I love it. That's a powerful reminder um, to not only be, uh, you know, have be perseverant in what you do, but you got to have character and integrity as well. So that's a great final message uh, from Elliot. I appreciate that. Elliot, how can our listeners find out more about you, uh, your companies, and this new book? Great. So Driven is on, on Amazon, Driven by Elliot Callen. It's two L's and one T. It's And my email address is Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T, at prosperityfinancialgroup.com. Obviously, the website is prosperityfinancialgroup.com. We've got a lot of episodes of Meet the Expert with Elliot Callen on there. And it's just a great podcast as well, like yours is. Uh, we'd love people to listen to it. And then finally, uh, there's charity on there. There's a lot of ways to live your life and good messages on there. Just listen. And if they want to call me directly, it's 510-206-1103. That's my cell. I'm on the West Coast. So don't call me at four in the morning. But if you want to talk about stuff and leadership and how you can help and run it up the flagpole, so to speak, I'm all ears. Fantastic. You heard that, listeners. Uh, we have an expert on the show. Elliot has shared what he has learned through his, uh, you know, building these businesses. He's written it down in a book called uh, Driven by Elliot Callen. And you need to get this book if you're, you know, thinking about starting a business or maybe you just started your business and you're saying, wow, this is really hard. Um, you want to learn from an expert that get this book. We'll have a link in the show notes and we'll have a link to all of um, Elliot's resources as well in the show notes. And again, this is why we bring experts on the show. So we can introduce you to a topic that's important. <clears throat> it might be very important for you right now in your career path. This is why we give you the expert. Reach out, talk to Elliot. He's going to help you along the way uh, and uh, learn from him. And again, we'll put a link to his podcast. And there's another great podcast to listen to. It's fantastic. And I know you'll love it as well. So um, follow these resources and reach out to Elliot and uh, get more information about what he's done. The book is called Driven, How to Elevate Your Success as an Entrepreneur. Great book. We'll put the link in the show notes. Elliot, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all of your expertise. Absolutely. My pleasure, John. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.